This episode was sponsored by Fair Anita, a shopping website challenging norms within the fashion industry and partnering with 8,000 women in nine countries around the world to create fair trade, handmade, ethical products from female artists and partners that are paid two to three times minimum wage. FairAnita.com. And by Bo Yeager, Rachel Kay, Jessica Smith, Kim Hokinson, Tracy Steeb, Janelise Cannon, Jill Harrigan, Maria Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Brian E. Lines, Tamzane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, Jessica Simpson Bedwell, and Eric and Carolyn Shumway. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. You made it. Hi, Katie. I made it. I trust you had no trouble with the time machine that I sent you? Oh, no, yes, worked perfectly. Oh, good. Welcome to 1831. Ah. We're outside 131 Kings Road, Brighton, England. Oh, I love Brighton. Having been invited to a dinner party by the Duchess St. Albans. Ooh. I hope you dressed accordingly. I, ooh. I'm going to really need you on your best game mm. here tonight. Please don't embarrass me. Okay. Look at this house. <laughs> it's grand white stone right on the beach mm. but also it's the first house in the regency square so it's like it's address number one. Oh, okay yeah i hope you know your regency manners i do i've read all the jane austen i can do the dances and everything <laughs> yes and this is jane austen's england we are right in the thick of it yeah here in 1831 and it's funny we call it that Jane Austen's England. <laughs> but if any woman gets to claim the Regency period, whose fame and influence define the period, it's Harriet Mellon. Hmm. This is Harriet Mellon's England. And yet I have never heard of her. Right. No one ever has. Wow. And I teach this period extensively. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Me too. And I had wow. never heard of her. She was only the richest woman in England. Wow. Can you believe she has invited us to dine? <laughs> oh my gosh, there she is. There she is. Okay, uh, curtsy or move your, remove your bonnet. I don't know. We're going to mess this up. <laughs> oh, okay. Check your dress. Lift one hand. Yeah. Curtsy. Ah, she's going to be judging us. I don't think I can participate at this high level of society. But wait. Can that be her? She seems jolly. Oh, she seems lighthearted, authentic, completely unpretentious. She she seems even humble. Well, I've heard the rumors. They say she was an illegitimate child of an Irish woman raised in a group of traveling actors. What? They say she rose from the darkest depths of poverty and abuse to become the richest woman in England. They say she's the kindest, most authentic, open-hearted person you'll ever know. Whoa. How could all that be true? <laughs> and if so, how come none of us has ever heard of her? Wow. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Olivia, I don't like your posture. You clearly don't know what to do with your gloves. Oh. You're going to expose us as time travelers. <laughs> but I've watched all the movies. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, our amateurish efforts are aided by a guide. We have the unmatched Dr. Ian Mortimer, author of the Time Traveler's Guide history series. Mm. And this conversation was extra thrilling for me because <laughs> he is a celebrity in my classrooms. <laughs> yep, my name is Dr. Ian Mortimer. I'm uh, an English historian. Uh, Really, I specialise in how we know what we know about the past and then presenting that to as wide a public as possible. Uh, but really, the, I'm going to be talking about my last book, The Time Traveller's Guide to Regency Britain, and in particular, the women who uh, had the, the dubious pleasure or horror of living through this period. 
<laughs> Those books are awesome. I love they them. They are awesome. So this is the one, The Time Traveler's Guide to Regency Britain. <gasps> yes. Just came out. And because his books take this refreshing historical approach as a guide for time travel, we are following suit. What I have increasingly come to feel is that the traditional ways of looking at the past are very much like pure mathematics opposed to applied mathematics. And what I'm trying to do is open people's eyes to an applied form of history where you can imagine yourself in the past. You can imagine yourself having to experience things outside your own time. And I just suddenly think, wow, isn't that exciting? We don't have to look at the world as being you know, 224,901 miles around the middle. It also has got great depth in time too. And I just you know, I get carried away with that all the time. Now, we've come to Harriet Mellon's house because Ian Mortimer told us to. <laughs> he discovered her story while researching his book. When I was researching wealth, her name came up. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I thought, who is she? And then when I realised that she was the illegitimate daughter of a travelling Irish woman, she was right at the very bottom of society. How did she become a millionaireess? I mean, I had to find out more. I mean, this is the... <laughs> I've heard of rags to riches stories in my time, but I'd never heard of a woman doing this. So I, I just mm. really was intrigued uh, as to what her life story was. And I, I was rewarded at every step of the way, I have to say, because everything about her was interesting, not only because it reflected something about her, but because it reflected something about society and it wasn't always good about society that it reflected. And when I was getting information about society like that, I thought this woman's gold dust for this book. I've got to include her. Mm. Okay, this is it. We've been called in to dine. Help us, Ian Mortimer. What do we do? Where do we sit? <laughs> is the prince here? <laughs> the regent is probably here. Yeah. It's Brighton. Which fork am I using? Of course, in, in this period, women were dominant when it came to entertaining. Uh, the hostess always sits at the head of the table and you wouldn't have had the option of uh, sitting next to the person you wanted to. You'd have sat hierarchically around the table. Um, she, of course, as the hostess, would be at the head and uh, she would have uh, commanded proceedings from there. And there she is at the head of the table. <gasps> she's beautiful. Yes. Actually, no, she's not. Oh. oh. <laughs> she wasn't a great beauty but she had the most incredible charm. And that endeared everybody who saw her. She doesn't have any of those things that you would think would make her famous and successful. And presumably she like married into money to become... She became wealthy on her own. What? Yeah. Okay, I'm, is... I was assuming she just married the wealthiest man in nope. England. The, well, what? that too. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. But this woman is so fascinating and unusual. She came from nothing and she made herself a life. Wow. A, she should be better known. That's, that goes without saying. Don't you think, how would you write her life in a novel? Because people wouldn't believe it. Yeah. The fact that her life was unbelievable was not lost on her. She talked about it all the time. She became a duchess, having been the illegitimate daughter of an Irish woman traveling players wardrobe assistant you know it's just, it's just unbelievable <laughs> and she knew it was unbelievable because there's a letter to um Sir Walter Scott who really liked her uh, in which she she said to him uh, you know just imagine it little me from that background a duchess and I keep thinking how weird it is that everyone knows about Jane Austen <laughs> No one knows about Harriet Mellon. Yeah, that's like, bizarre. No one. And she was a storyteller, too, hmm. of sorts. She was a storyteller of the stage rather than on paper. And there she is at the head of the table, not trying to hide her origins or wow. pretend. She's very open. In fact, uh, did you hear that? She's saying, When I was a little girl without a penny to my name or a hope in the world starving for bread... She was, as I say, illegitimate, born in 1777, 11th November 1777. Her mother is this Irish woman who was the costumer for a group of traveling players. 
And this mm. is not a high class group of traveling players. <laughs> These are people like ragtag group performing in barns in exchange yeah for sleeping in the barn mm. that night, that kind of thing. There was a great line in a review of this book in The Times when it came out. In fact, it was the first review and it just made my day because the, the reviewer, Andrew Taylor, said the great thing about this book is it would have told Jane Austen things about Regency Britain that she didn't know. And that <laughs> nailed it for me because that's what yeah. I was trying to do. Jane Austen yeah. would not have known about the courts of Liverpool or the slums of Manchester and Birmingham. Um, she yeah. just would never have been there or seen that level of poverty because nice girls didn't go to that sort of place. Now, yeah. Harriet would have met people like that in the pub. I mean, she may well have been you know, camping out in the barn with the rest of the troop, probably was, uh, staying so like five to a room in an inn when they played. And she must have seen the diseases that affected the very poor. Harriet's mother will be the overpowering force in her life. She always told Harriet that her father was a soldier in the British Army, a nobleman. And she <laughs> always said, you have noble blood in your veins. Mm. The father went away to war and died, of course. Heroically. And there was never any evidence of yep. such a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But her mother will never, ever let that go. Harriet <laughs> is noble. <laughs> and she should act accordingly. By the way, how do we know all of this? She shared her memoirs in her lifetime. Oh. And there were another couple biographies that were written just after her death. One is a big smear campaign, and then one uh -huh. is an attempt to restore her character. <laughs> and, uh, and so we have lots of sources. Yeah. Meanwhile, the mother marries. And so she had a stepfather who was a musician, and between her mother, who provided the clothes and the, the, the costumes for the, the travelling uh, actors, and uh, her stepfather, who played the music, she was constantly aware of the, 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 the drama business. This stepdad is jolly, and he seems caring, and I do like him, but he is also, quote, disposed to drink and low company. Uh. He's in the alehouse with the dregs of society, drinking <laughs> away all their money all the time. Mm -hmm. Her mother has a separate set of vices. <laughs> Ferocious, ambitious, mm. violent, oh. verbally and physically abusive. Oh. Her mother, who is Mrs. Entwizzle, she sent Harriet to high class schools, but she didn't have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And so so they would often do a lot of trading, like trade music lessons or sewing for school lessons. And being penniless at the high class school is a worse experience often than not being at the high class school. Yeah, but she has to go to the high class school because she's noble. Yeah. But also hide the fact that she is penniless. Mm. <laughs> um, so here's an excerpt from her memoirs that really gives us an idea of what her reality is like growing up. And yeah, remember that memoirs back then, it was really fashionable to write them in the third person. Mm -hmm. The Memoirs of Harriet, Duchess of St. Albans, edited by Margaret Harry's Baron Wilson, 1840. When Harriet Mellon was about four years old, and as full of fun as possible, she was sent to a day school of little creatures like herself, kept by an aged dame who they denominated their granny. Harriet was always playing tricks on her schoolfellows, hiding their bonnets, cloaks, satchels, etc., and one of them, in retaliation, played on her a trick which had nearly produced fatal consequences. A little girl's primer was missing when she wanted to say her letters from it. It afterwards appeared that one of the scholars, by her own confession, had in jest put it into Harriet Mellon's school bag to cause trouble. The granny ordered a general examination of property, and at the top of Harriet's bag was the unlikely primer discovered. In vain, the poor child protested she knew nothing of its being there. She was sent home to her mother, guarded by some other children, with an account of her misdemeanor upon the circumstantial evidence. Mrs. Entwizzle was engaged in making up some clothes, and being too busy to leave off, she told the children they might go back and inform the granny that Harriet should be properly punished before long. Harriet was left alone with her mother, in too great terror to speak, to cry, or to move. 
Mrs. Entwistle, however, without comment, continued her employment, which, having finished, she folded up as calmly as if nothing were to ensue. She then took Harriet in her arms without question, or allowing her to speak, to the courtyard, and placed her under a pump. Here she held the child and inundated her with water, keeping it pouring over her long after she had become through terror insensible. In this state, she threw the child into a dark shed and closed the door, allowing her to remain a considerable time without notice. So long a period elapsed without Harriet's voice being heard that the passionate woman became alarmed for the results of her anger and opened the door of the shed. There, in a heap on the ground, lay the little creature, insensible, just as she had been thrown in, her clothes streaming and her face the hue of death. Mrs. Entwistle concluded she had murdered her only darling, and the wild cries of horror which she raised alarmed the neighborhood. The child was undressed by some humane persons, placed in a warm bed, and after some time recovered. But she was afraid to open her eyes, for Mrs. Entwistle was in such a passion of grief at her own barbarity that the still confused child thought it was continued anger against her, and she had better lie still. At length, hearing her mother threaten to kill herself, she ventured to speak, and the revulsion of feeling nearly caused the fitful Irish woman to smother by her embraces the partially recovered treasure. It was a long time before poor Harriet was well enough to revisit school, and when she did, no more tricks were played upon her. Wealth inequality in the Regency period is staggering. Yeah. I mean, you can see why the sense of revolution was in the air, because you got... People yeah. at the bottom of society have got nothing, and they've got nothing to sell part of their labour. Uh, and then the biggest surprise for me in writing about Regency Britain was what real poverty meant in this period. Yes. Um, where life expectancy at birth in some towns, 13 or 14. Uh, but at the other end of the spectrum, just most incredible riches. Incredible. Mm. I mean, in London, I mean, the, the, the life expectancy figures for London alone, which is not an industrial town in this time, you know, if you're a gentleman or, or somebody like that, you would expect to live to 44. A, a, a tradesman, uh, 25, but a worker or a member of a worker's family, 22. Half, you know. These days we expect the, the very poor to live about 90% as long as the very rich. That's the way it seems, seems to work out. But in, um, in that period, no, it was half. Uh, just staggering poverty, um, shortages of food, and a, a real sense of anxiety on the streets. And in another episode, Harriet is, of course, the poorest of the poor. She doesn't have any decent clothes, so her mother wouldn't let her go to church with her parents at the local parish near their house because the people would see her shabby clothes and her... <laughs> lack of shoes. Mm. So her mom forced her to walk miles to a different church where poor people lived every <laughs> Sunday. But being Harriet, she turned this into an opportunity. This girl is resilient. The veil between Lord Talbot's estate and the town was a great gathering place for the children to play, and Harriet, whose love of amusement was unconquerable, used to steal out perpetually to this pretty spot, where she was unrivaled amongst the young ladies as a player at ball. The wondering children, who were all better dressed than the vagrant member of the aristocracy, used to torment poor Harriet dreadfully, respecting the visionary grandeur. She bore it all with perfect good humor, if they would only play ball with her. And their assemblies were delightful, until the light-footed Mrs. Entwistle would slip in amongst them and disperse the terrified mockers of high blood, like chaff before the wind. Numbers of her playmates are now living, and well remember the disagreeable interruption which Mrs. Entwistle would cause in her daughter's athletic amusements by driving her home with heavy blows, some of which occasionally fell on the associates, and amidst dreadful reproaches the perpetual taunt that she was a disgrace to the high blood in her veins. And yet, Harriet's 
joy and laughter always bubbled back up to the surface. She had an unconquerable joie de vivre. Oh, I love her. It was in a barn she did her first performance, and she was a great success as a nine-year-old, uh, uh, rosy-cheeked young girl playing this role. And people loved her. I mean, they just really warmed to her. And she actually started earning money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But she never saw a penny of it Mm. because her mother always claimed it. And all too often, their money went to either the stepfather in the alehouse Mm -hmm. or perhaps even more frequently for buying replacement dishes after her parents threw them at each other. The memoirs have so many specific and just heartbreaking scenes. This one stands out in my mind. Harriet Millen was announced at Bridge North during the winter of 1790 for some juvenile character, and the narrator took his place in the orchestra to see the performance. The overture had terminated and had been played again, yet still the curtain was not raised. After a considerable delay, the piece commenced, and when the scene came wherein Harriet Mellon should have appeared, another child went through the character. Alarmed at the absence of his playmate, the narrator left the orchestra and heard the following strange tale. Mrs. Endwizzle, it appeared, had had a quarrel with her daughter, respecting the performance, and she had beaten poor Harriet so severely while dressing for her part that the latter ran out of the house without her frock, shawl, or bonnet, her mother following with vows of vengeance. Fear lent the girl wings to avoid her parents' rage. She ran through the north gate and entered some fields where her mother soon lost all trace of the fugitive. It was perfectly dark and a severe frost had for some time prevailed. The performance concluded, but the frightened child did not return, and all the manager's sons were out during the entire night, taking various directions about the environs of the town and carrying their piteous inquiries to the different farmhouses. No intelligence was to be obtained of her having taken shelter from the severe cold, which the searchers found almost too intense to endure. Therefore, the general dread was that the despairing child had fallen or thrown herself into the river. The manager's kind family came in at different times next day from their fruitless search, greatly distressed at the fate of their little companion. It was Sunday and about midday The family party had just assembled at dinner, when Harriet Mellon slowly put her face into the room, but scarcely bearing the appearance of anything human. Her arms were pressed tightly across her figure, shivering with cold. Her fine complexion was totally concealed by a thick coating of black, which was furrowed by the tears she had shed during the night. She re-entered in terror and gave the following account of the way she had passed the night. After escaping from my mother, I ran on in the dark, across numbers of fields, still frightened and thinking that I heard the sound of her steps and voice on the wind. I wandered on until I was obliged to stop from being so tired, and I cried a long time. Then I saw some lights at a distance, and I set out again to reach them, though I was almost too cold to move. When I came near the lights, I found that they were great smoky fires from brick kilns and coal pits. To warm myself, I drew near the fires, but the frightful men I saw attending them alarmed me so much, I was obliged to hide myself in the thick smoke and to change my place very often to escape being seen by them. From the extreme severity of the night and her partial state of clothing, it was surprising the poor girl had not perished with the cold. Her very long black hair, covered with hoarfrost, was matted in heavy masses, her face and neck blackened with the brick kiln smoke, and scored with her tears, so that altogether the pretty Harriet was changed to the semblance of a sprite from the lower regions. She had not broken her fast since the preceding day's dinner, and was quite faint from exhaustion. But while they administered some food, Mr. and Mrs. Entwizzle, by an unfortunate chance, entered the room. Like a startled hare, Harriet 
flew into a corner behind the chairs to avoid her mother, who passionately exclaimed, Let me reach her, I will be the death of her. All violence was, however, prevented by the family of the manager, except the violence of a tongue which nothing could allay. At length, when the manager calmly but with decision told her he could not feel justified in trusting her good, unoffending child home again until Mrs. Entwistle pledged her word solemnly that she would act more kindly in the future, she gave this promise with very bad grace. And then a fresh scene ensued to induce poor Harriet to go home. She clung in an agony of terror to the friendly manager, and he was obliged to leave the house, half leading, half supporting the terrified child to her home, where he reminded Mrs. Entwistle again of her solemn engagement and left the disunited family. There was not much hope of amendment in this violent woman, and indeed her temper was impaired by the weak extravagance of Mr. Entwistle, whose love of low conviviality induced him to waste in company, which was so much wanted at home. Uh, how old is she? Probably 12. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And her mother was widely hated for her false pride, her cruelty, her arrogance. Mm. And Harriet somehow became the opposite of all of those things. Hmm. How did she do it? Yeah. Even just imagining living in the poor half of Regency society. Yeah. Ian Mortimer acknowledges that it would take such strength just to survive. We would have needed to be very strong physically. We'd need to be resen resilient psychologically. I don't think I would have coped. I, I don't think I would have dealt with the, the brutal um, macho elements of society. I don't think I'd have coped very well with seeing extraordinary differences between rich and poor. Um, I don't think I'd have been able to see the, the deprivation, the, the lack of opportunities to so many people. I don't think I'd have happily gone along to a hanging. Um, we romanticise this period. I romanticise this period because all the things I do like, the wit and the drinking and the, you know, the, the, the extraordinary characters of the period and the great inventions of the period, I romanticise the period. But when I stop to think about what it's really like, I know that I would have been deeply distressed just walking the streets. Somehow she didn't just cope. She kept her spirits up. She had an easy laughter and a spark that everyone around her could see. <laughs> she just had like this humility and goodness. When she'd pass the town jail, she always felt so bad for the prisoners. She didn't have anything to give yeah. them. But if she had like a scrap of bread, she would give it to them instead wow. of keep it for herself. I think in her character lay her deliverance mm. because all the other young girls, they loved her. They rallied around her. They gave her their clothes. Once they realized what was happening at home, they invited her to stay at their houses Aww. so she never had to go back home to her parents. Wow. And when they were with her, when she passed the jail, they would give her a penny to put in the donation box. Aww. By the time she was 17, and in one of her performances... Sheridan. Richard Sheridan, the great theatre guru mm. from London. Theater, um, entrepreneur, impresario. Legend. Playwright. <laughs> he came north for a visit. He was the honorary guest at the races. And Harriet Mellon's friends rallied hard. <laughs> they made their parents invite him to tea. They sent him notes. They all pressured him, go and see Harriet Mellon perform. You will find wow. a diamond in the rough. And he came along to see her in one of her barn performances and he was quite charmed too. And he thought, I'll give her a go on uh, the, the London stage. <laughs> Yay! It's her big break. Oh, okay. That's how she does it. Yep. 
I think in many ways she had a great blessing in being from birth part of uh, an acting troupe who really had to earn their way. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Fair Anita. They're on a mission to create a world where women feel safe, valued, and respected, no matter their geography. Fair Anita offers fair trade products ethically sourced from 8,000 plus women in nine countries across the world. Fair Anita's bags, jewelry, gifts, scarves, clothes, and more are all made in ethical working conditions. Almost all their products are made from recycled materials, carbon footprint offset, handmade, locally sourced, and beautiful. I am right now wearing this amazing hand stamped bracelet, which says, Ooh. We create ourselves as we go. I love that. Which is my motto for the year. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I'm going to be I'm... buying a lot of gifts from Fair Anita this year. Yeah. All the things that they have on there is stuff I can really get behind, you know, like... They have these great shirts yes. that say Sisterhood, Sisterhood is, powerful. is Powerful. Yes, obviously <laughs> we need those. Mm -hmm. These are actual ethical fair trade goods and they're gorgeous. Yeah, and look at this. This hand-carved mango wood box that I got. Jewelry box with the line drawing of a female face mm. in the front. And check this out, Olivia. Here's an unboxing in front of you. I got <laughs> these earrings. And look, see how they come in this cute little cotton Theranita bag. But can you hear these earrings? They're beautiful. And they all have um, a story to wait tell. Wait a minute. Yes. I see what you're I thinking. I have a question. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you don't have your ears I, pierced, right? That's right. But look, these earrings are irresistible. <laughs> I've been meaning to get my ears pierced for years, and I'm just going to do it. And these beautiful wow. earrings you can hear, they're going to be my first. Well, there's an endorsement. And almost all of their products are under $20. Use the code HERNAME, all one word and all caps, and you'll get 10% off any order. Cute, ethical, affordable. Farinita.com. Hi. I'm Liza Powell O'Brien, and I'm a writer, a reader, and Conan's wife. I'm here to tell you about my brand new podcast for Team Coco called Significant Others. Join me each week as I tell you something you might not know about a person you probably do, like Vera Nabokov, without whom the world might never have known the book Lolita. Talented Team Coco friends like Nick Offerman, Megan Mullally, Jamila Jamil, and Timothy Oliphant help me bring these stories to life. We have a new story every week, so be sure to subscribe to Significant Others wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss any of the drama. The whole family moves to London. The whole family. Oh. Yes. <laughs> The whole family. Her parents go with her. Mm. And her mother is always micromanaging her life and her career. Mm. She's never seen anything like it. She is a, a poor country bumpkin performing in barns. Wow. Harriet reports to Richard Sheridan. She knocks on the door. And knocks on the door. Finally, the door creaks open. And there's Sheridan, he's disheveled, hung over. Who are you? Oh, oh I, I'm Harriet Mellon from Stafford. I've come to join your troupe at the Drury Lane Theater. He scratches his face. I don't know any Harriet Mellon. Oh no. Sir, you told me. I don't need any actors. You've wasted your time. Goodbye. Crushing deal breaker. Oh. For a less resilient soul, perhaps, but this is Harriet <laughs> Mellon, and she has bounced back mm -hmm. from much, much worse over and over and over. <laughs> oh, Olivia, we're on our third course, and I'm really feeling it. Yeah, these parties are... Uh, different wine with every course, yeah. too. This is getting intense. They're not for the faint of digestion. Yeah. 
the richness of life was celebrated through food and drink. Um, mm. They drank a phenomenal amount. I've got to say that aristocrats of the time, uh, the Duke of York, who was the second son of uh, George III, drank six bottles of claret every single day. That's 2.7, 2.8 litres of uh, claret or red wine every day. I'm not sure I could, I would last that long, to be honest. And then I read that Pitt, who I would say is the greatest prime minister this country's ever had, drank seven bottles of port a day. Seven bottles wow. of port, and the port was 24% alcohol, stronger than modern oh. port, which perhaps explains why he was frequently found asleep in the House of Commons. <laughs> so I think if you were sitting there at, at dinner with Harriet, um, well, the ladies obviously would leave for the serious drinking amongst the men. Uh, the men, by her day, were allowed to leave the drinking company and go and join the ladies. Uh, oh. So it would have been less segregated and strict than it was in the say the 1760s and 1770s when the men had to stay that they weren't allowed out of the room for any reason not even go to the loo uh, until everybody was dead drunk um, <laughs> which is you know, to my mind repulsive and also missing the main point you want to go and talk to the ladies don't want to just chat to other blokes all evening <laughs> so yeah, things would have been more sociable by by her day uh, uh, more convivial quick Say something witty so we don't stand out as total weirdos. <laughs> oh, well, did you hear what the, the Prince Regent said last night? Oh, tee -hee -hee. so witty. There is a real wit in society, and I enjoy Regency wit because it is often genuinely original, off the wall, and unlike the more primitive wit of uh, the medieval period or even Elizabethan times, there are, it's, it's much rarer that there are victims. This place is elegant. I mean, look at these dishes. Mm -hmm. Look at that chandelier. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose for one moment she ever took her good fortune for granted. And are these like, I mean, are these like Brighton Regency parties? Like, is this sex in the back room and opium and, I mean, the Regents parties right. were insane. I don't think so. Mm. Because... There were no scandals attached to her, which is interesting for an actress. 100% free of scandal her mm. entire life. She was just wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's unheard of. <clears throat> my lady, to return to your career, my dear Duchess, uh, how did you finally catch a break <laughs> on the Drury Lane stage? Oh, I should sound British. It's the TARDIS. It'll do it for you. <laughs> <clears throat> to return to your career, my dear Duchess, <laughs> how did you finally catch a break on the Drury Lane stage? I think I'm from... I was going to say, wow, that, we're, now, we're definitely yeah. getting kicked out now. <laughs> we have revealed ourselves. <laughs> I don't even know what accent that was, but it was not. Me neither. Right. It was a, a survey of accents. <laughs> Oh, she's so kind. She's answering me, though. <laughs> After much persistence, hmm. Richard Sheridan let her in. Wow. And it was her big night for the opening role in one of the leads. She was so nervous. Oh, no. She was shaking the whole time. If you're setting me up for another... Yeah, I am setting you up. Oh, no, come on. She botched it. Oh. Yep. This is not one of those stories where she gets her big break and she nails it and she becomes rich and famous. <laughs> She's going to be an understudy for years. Mm. She will slowly squeeze her way in. Mm. She practices every role. Practice, 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 practice. And then, and then she becomes a famous actress. All right. It must have been an extraordinary transformation going through all those different milieu. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the travelling players, the London stage, the glitterati who surrounded the, uh, the famous actors and actresses of the time. So she started earning money. Now, when you earned money as an actress on the London stage, this was really significant because there weren't many roles in life where women could earn at that level. She was doing well. She was earning hundreds of pounds a year. 
And one of my favorite aspects of her career is so interesting because it kind of bridges this class divide that her whole life bridges. There's this contrast between the London stage, there's Drury Lane, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the provincial theater and there's the London season where all the great actors are in London performing. But then when the season ends, they kind of scatter to the different provincial theaters and they will off season, they'll perform there. Then they'll return to London. Mm. Nobody wants to go to Liverpool <laughs> because they're famously ruthless in Liverpool. These are the, the ruffians up mm. north who boo people off the stage and <laughs> you know, they have like no respect for nobody. Yeah. And she goes to Liverpool her very first season. Mm. What is Building it? Building resilience again. Yeah. <laughs> is it self-destruction or mm. is it like confidence? She's so bold. Or she, is it just that's what she could get? I mean, yeah, she's the understudy. That's all there is? Yeah. That's who goes to Liverpool. <laughs> right. They love her hmm. on the Liverpool stage instant fame there on the provincial stage wow and she goes back year after year after year the liverpudlians bless their souls when they are visited by the actual a-list actors <laughs> that harriet mellon has been mimicking uh. they boo them off the stage and <laughs> accuse them of copying harriet mellon oh no <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Her first real fortunes are made in Liverpool, not in London. Wow. By the end of her career, she was earning £600 a year. Um, now, to put that in proportion, your average shopkeeper was earning 40 to £50 a year at that time. So 10 times what a shopkeeper would be earning. And here's what she did with her money. Hmm. The first paycheck she ever got... She mailed it to her old friends, the Wright family in Stafford, hmm. and set up a Christmas dinner party for everybody in the jail. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> did she give it to the jail? Oh. Yep. And she funds it in perpetuity. Forever they will have a giant Christmas feast wow. on her. She set up some of her childhood friends from her ball game days. Mm. She set them up with annuities for life. Oh. She adopted an orphan girl, and they would do everything together for 19 years. Aww. When she heard there was a famine in Ireland, she was so torn up by the news. She purchased a ship. She filled it with flour, clothes, medicine, blankets, <laughs> everything. And she sent it to Ireland herself, completely wow. on her own dime, but anonymously. Okay, I, I love her. Me too! And I'm and so mad that I have never heard of her. What? She's just like the perfect character. She's like a Dickens character. <laughs> yeah. How did a woman like this fall through the cracks? Yeah. Mind-blowing. And somewhere in there, she gets to know a Mr. Coots, who is a lovely old gentleman, who also was pretty shabbily dressed. And he rather liked her and they got to know each other and they became companions. Now, Thomas Coote was married. His wife, though, was not well. Uh, she had dementia. Um, and Thomas Coote just happened to be one of the richest men in England. You could presume that she had become his mistress and maybe she had. No one knows. And we can all say it's probable or whatever, but we're just in putting our own readings onto that. What is certain is that when Mrs. Coote died in 1815, Thomas asked, who was then 79, asked Harriet, who by that stage was 37, if she would marry him. She said yes, and within six weeks of the old Mrs. Coote departing, there was a new Mrs. Coote, Harriet. But they clearly were devoted to each other. They'd already known each other very well for the last 10 years, and the remaining seven years of Thomas Coote's life were blissfully happy with her. And when Thomas died in 1822, his daughters all expected to inherit a vast fortune. He did a remarkable thing. He made only one bequest. He left everything, including his half of Coote's bank, to Harriet. <laughs> which was an enormous sign of trust. Yeah. Because he was basically saying, if my daughters deserve anything, I trust you to decide what they deserve. 
And when they'd been really nice to her for the first 10 years, when they, she was just his companion, they really turned nasty, all three of them. Mm. And Harriet never betrayed that trust. She would always speak about Thomas as the best man who ever lived. After she remarried, she was still saying this. And her, and her, her judgment was that all three of those daughters should be given a, a large amount of money every year. She gave them a vast amount of money for them to have as their own personal income from their father's bank every year. She didn't need to do that, but she didn't think that their unkindness to her should be repaid with unkindness. And that really made me think, hey, this is, this is some gal. <laughs> So she has uh, freed herself of the parents, apparently? Actually, Are they... no. Oh, see, she... there's nice and then there's mm -hmm. doormat. Yeah. <laughs> In that previous episode, you said, what What would you, what would be the worst thing to be remembered as? And you said, doormat Olivia. Ah. Right? Yeah. And so is this doormat Harriet Mellon or is this a good, kindly soul? It's so uh, interesting. I don't know. I you, can't yes, decide. Yes, I mean, yes, yeah. it is good to be good and kindly, but also... Boundaries. Yes. Right? I've she, fought very hard yeah. at boundaries yeah. in my life, and I want others to learn the same. Right. <laughs> she took care of her parents to the very end. Mm. She supported them financially. When they hemorrhaged her money, she gave them more money. She mm. set them up with a music shop in Cheltenham that they could run themselves. After her mom died, she let her stepdad live with her, even though everybody said, this oh. guy is an alehouse drunk. He does <laughs> not belong on Regency Square in Brighton with nice people like you. Well, and that's fine. He's he's neutral, right? It's the he's abusive the... mother that shouldn't yep. be around. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. Hmm. She was grateful to them her whole life. She was grateful to absolutely everybody. She's basically just, she's a, a Zen master. Pollyanna. <laughs> a Zen grateful Pollyanna. for everything wow. that came her way because it made her who she was. Wow. The better person than me. Yeah. And that, I'm sh I, I can't imagine being that beneficent. Yeah. And wise and Zen. Yeah. Where'd she get it from? Five years after Thomas Coutts died, she married the Duke of St Albans, who was then 26, and she was coming up 50. So not only she had a 42-year age gap with her first husband, but there was a 23-year age gap with her second husband. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and every St Patrick's Day, till the day she died, Harriet Mellon would dress in humble clothes and walk to her first little hovel of a house in mm -hmm. London. And she would stand outside and cry at her luck. Wow. They say even on her deathbed, after she fell ill and everyone knew the end was near, that you could hear happy chatter and peals of laughter from her hmm. bedroom. She had this sense of joy to the very end. And she was ready for the end. She was not afraid at all. She talked about it all the time. Again, Zen master. Yeah, the, the good death. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's worth 1.8 million when she died in 1837. And you, you don't need me to say there weren't many millionaires in the country in those days. We're talking about somebody having wealth to the extent of 36,000 times the average income. It's something in the region of 12 billion. I mean, if you think in terms of that amount of wealth, I managed to find one person who's definitely wealthier and some others who might have been. We are talking about phenomenal wealth. Anyway, she died at the age of 60 in 1837 and she left her Duke 10,000 pounds a year for life and two houses and gave all the rest of the money to Thomas Coote's youngest granddaughter, who ended up becoming a great philanthropist to the poor of Victorian England. So ultimately, she made an even better decision by giving the money to somebody who was going to spend it on benefiting other people. So the money, it wow. really did do so much good in the world. Oh, I'm glad we were able to come to this dinner party and see her in person because if we wanted to get a sense of her in 2022, 
Hmm. We would have to dig so deep to find her. When I was researching this, I, I thought, OK, where are some uh, good portraits of her? And one of them is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. And it's a full length portrait. And I thought, I'll go and see it. And it didn't occur to me for one moment that they wouldn't have it on display. But I got there and I, I said, where is it? And they said, well, it's not on show. We don't keep it on show. We don't show it. Surely there ought to... We've got, I think, four publicly owned portraits of her in this country and none of them are on display. Isn't that amazing? So even though we have this story and we're frequently looking back at uh, women in the past saying we should make more of women's stories in the past because because of the nature of the way things get written down, they get written down by men, about men more than any other. Here you've got a woman who's really the, an the answer to so much of this and we lock her away in a cupboard. And I'm just appalled by that. And here comes the dessert sherry. <laughs> Everyone's tipsy. I've eaten myself into oblivion. Absolutely no decorum whatsoever. She's definitely on to us. You blew it. I'm a failed Regency woman. I think we all universally have the same reaction to the story in that, my God, you know, going from that level of poverty to that level of wealth and dignity and... Every time I talk about uh, Regency Britain, I have always asked, has anybody ever heard of Harriet Mellon? And nobody has yet put up their hand. There are people out there with the most extraordinary stories about whom we've never heard. I do keep thinking about what Ian Mortimer said, that perhaps having to earn your own way having to fight teeth and nail mm. maybe it is a kind of blessing that's that's what she was saying mm. and thank everybody in every step of the way in her life yeah it depends i guess what the goal is but it's definitely a head start on wisdom well, it's it's a head start <laughs> to either being a very good person or a very oh, bad person. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what Harriet Mellon models to me, I guess. Like perspective, authenticity, mm. gratitude. I mean, the big question that her life seems to answer is how far will goodness and gratitude take you? Mm. She was no great beauty. She's no great talent. She had no privilege, no advantage. And yet... Hmm. I think a dinner um, in her heyday as uh, Mrs. Coote or um, uh, as the Duchess of St. Albans would have been great fun. And I'd like to have asked questions about her background in that environment, surrounded by wealth. Seems to be a kind-hearted woman. Because... In some ways, she had travelled to a far-off land that none of them would have seen. She had been places that they could only imagine in their worst nightmares. I, I, I think she probably would have wanted to open eyes rather than allow everybody's eyes to remain shut. There's so much more. The book is so good. Both Ian Mortimer's book and Harriet Mellon's memoirs, hmm. page turners, highly recommended. And in fact, I asked Ian Mortimer to read a paragraph from his book featuring Harriet Mellon. And so we'll give him the last word. Okay, are you sitting comfortably? Thus the illegitimate daughter of a penniless Irish peasant woman becomes a duchess and one of the richest people in the kingdom, with a personal fortune of about two million pounds. This she controls herself through her partnership in the bank, not having to yield to her husband, even though he is a duke. It may well be a man's world, but Harriet Mellon manages to overcome poverty, sexual prejudice and all the degrees of class snobbery to lift herself above it and never has to trade respectability for respect along the way. If 
If you want to learn more about Harriet Mellon, we've got you covered. Head to our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, where we've got links to two volumes of Harriet Mellon's memoirs, plus all of Ian Mortimer's Time Traveler's guidebooks, the Harriet Mellon collection of items at the British Museum, and so much more, whatshernamepodcast.com. And special thanks to Dr. Ian Mortimer for bringing us Harriet Mellon. Music for this episode was recorded by Sir Cubworth, Esther Abrami, Asher Fulero, Cooper Cannell and Beethoven, Joel Cummins, Emmett Fenn, Wayne Jones, and Daniel Foster Smith. Our interns are Katie Boucher and Livia Foley. This is the final episode of season 12, but fear not, we will be back with season 13 in October. You can always follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you so much for donating. Thanks for listening. 